Well, Merry Christmas to you. Go ahead and turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 12 on this Sunday following Christmas. I'm going to invite you to look at what is really a song of praise. It's a song that bursts forth from the heart of Isaiah the prophet and is recorded just a few chapters after that great oracle of God is revealed. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now I'm compelled to introduce myself every time I enter the pulpit, and I really, I really shouldn't. I've been at First Baptist for almost eight years, but this Sunday is different for a number of reasons, and chief among them is that I'm never here on this Sunday. Uh, my wife and I are both Texas transplants, and this time of year we are always either in Amarillo or in Waco, traveling home to be with our families uh, to, uh, to spend uh, the holidays there. Maybe you are in the same situation. You are from here. You grew up at this church, but now you live all over and you've made your way back home for the holidays and you're in your home church where this strange person is about to preach to you. Well, my name is Joel Harder. I'm the pastor for Discipleship and Missions. And the reason why Donnell and I could not go to Texas was that we are celebrating the birth of a new baby who was born right at Thanksgiving and we couldn't travel until she was a month old and could get those uh, four-week immunizations. So we found ourselves here at our home, just the four of us on Christmas Day. And maybe you are thinking back to the first time you, you really could say that. Uh, we wandered into the living room lazily and sipped coffee and watched our two-year-old just tear her way through some presents. And let me tell you, it was joy, pure joy in our living room that morning. A couple observations I have about Felice's joy. Uh, first, it was without restraint. It pulsed through every fiber of her being. She was a child living in the fullness of her parents' favor, and she knew it. Secondly, her joy was contagious. She wanted us to see and to taste and to enter into her joy with her, and we did. But also, I noticed her joy was without understanding. Her heart was engaged, that is for sure, but... What was the reason for all these presents? What made this morning so glorious? What is the occasion for this celebration? And why, oh why, didn't we do it the next day? These were all questions that I'm sure she had no answers for. She probably wasn't even asking them, but it's okay. She's two. But I believe that this is the question that God has laid on my heart for us this morning, do we understand the joy of Christmas? In our own hearts, do we appreciate the depth of what it means for a child to be born to us, for a son to be given, or are we just going through the motions, eating the food, exchanging the gifts, and yes, experiencing the real joy of Christmas, but without fully understanding it? And from there, I just want to ask a quick follow-up question. What do we do with this joy? How should we respond to it? Well, to answer that question, let's look in Isaiah chapter 12. We are reading six verses. It's a song, a joyful celebration, an overflow from the heart of the glorious salvation of God that is to come in the Messiah, a child that will one day be born. In the book of Isaiah, this short chapter serves as a transition from the previous section of prophecies, some of the most famous and poignant messianic prophecies that the Jewish nation had. It's where God has revealed his plan to do something that was before unthinkable. It was incomprehensible, specifically the incarnation. At this time of year, we see this word, Emmanuel, a lot. It's the word that means God with us, and it dominates this Christmas season. If you grew up in the church, you knew this word by the age of five at least. But would it surprise you to know that this word, which so dominates the vocabulary of the church at Christmas time, only occurs in the Bible three times? Depending on your translation, perhaps a fourth time. The NIV, I believe, has it a fifth time. But that's it. Three, four, maybe five times this word. 
The first time is in Isaiah chapter 7, where we read that God himself will give us a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. And then again, we read it in chapter 8, that Emmanuel is named as the Savior who steps into the mire of his besieged people. And at the name of of this Emmanuel, the weapons of the enemies, the, the schemes and strategies that they have will not prevail. God's people will not be overtaken. And why, Isaiah says, because God is with us. And what else is this Emmanuel like? Well, that's really what we're reading in chapter 9 when we read that famous passage, For unto us a child is born. We read the text to say, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. These, these we read on the banners around us, these are the eternal attributes of a God who Colossians 1 says Jesus is the image of. I want to stop and dwell on this, on this quality, the Prince of Peace. Because so many of us are in such desperate need of peace. With headlines like Paris and San Bernardino, how do we endure such times? Well, consider this. It's almost always in the midst of distress and in the pains of chaos and conflict that we become acutely aware of the nature of peace, the joy of relief. Are you living in a state of anxiety or depression or fear? Then you, you probably can more clearly articulate what it would be like to be free of it, to have peace. As our world faces egregious evil with anxiety and insecurity, we are all living with a greater yearning for a world at peace. And we now intuitively can sense the nature of God's peace. We learn more what he's like as we consider what we lack. There is a kingdom of peace, complete peace. And here in Isaiah, we learn that the prince of that realm is coming to our world. Yes, the prophet is revealing the magnificent mystery of the incarnation. The creator God enters into the creation. To understand the gravity of this fact, we have to think in theological terms. Before the incarnation, were, were God to physically appear in his creation, we would call that a couple things. One of the things we would call that is a theophany. A theophany, it's a theological term, and it is every instance where the creator God physically appears in his creation prior to the incarnation. And when that happens, we are given a glimpse of the awe-inspiring power of the God who made all things. We see something that is wholly different than humanity, that is set apart and is holy. A burning fire that defies the laws of nature when it does not consume the bush that is before Moses. The pillar of smoke and fire that is guarding and protecting the Israelites from Pharaoh's advancing armies. The thunderous cloud on Mount Sinai, the storm and tempest from which God speaks to Job, the fourth man in Nebuchadnezzar's fire who saves and preserves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Isaiah himself is called to be prophet, he's drawn into the presence of God and he falls on his face and cries out, Woe to me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. One of my favorite, favorite worship songs has these words in it. You are the high and exalted one, the one the angels fear. So high above me in every way, Lord, how can I draw near to the one the angels fear? Let me say it one more time. A theophany is every instance where the creator God physically appears in his creation prior to the incarnation. But when Mary conceives, somehow, in all his majesty and mystery, the limitless creator of heaven and earth 
is contained in the growing child within her womb. And when Jesus is born and grows up, the one who laid the foundations of the earth and spoke to the oceans this far and no farther will you rise, steps into the story of human history as one of us. Emmanuel, God with us. This is the reason we sing joy to the world. The creator has taken on flesh and dwells among us to create a way for sinful humanity to draw near to God and not be afraid but be comforted beyond our wildest imagination. People can, draw, can dwell with God again. This is the good news. This is the beginning of understanding the joy of Christmas, and it is at this understanding Isaiah writes his song. Look in chapter 12, it says, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. At this point, I want to urge us to follow the prophet's lead. While Emmanuel is joy to all the world, there's not a person alive for whom this is not joyous news. Isaiah is telling me and he's telling you to respond personally to God's salvation. At the beginning of this song and again at the end, the prophet uses the singular, ver, uh, the singular form of you. He's saying in that day, you will say, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Here's an important difference between priests and prophets. The priests are responsible for maintaining the faith tradition, but the prophet, the prophet is very different. The prophet receives a message from God. He reveals the heart of God. He gives the people a vision for God's glory and how he's acting in the world around us. He calls us out of ourselves to meet God where he's going. He ignites in us a passion to follow the Lord wherever he leads, to be the voice in the wilderness that cries out, Here am I! Send me! Because I want to go where you're going, God. The priest leads the people in dutiful worship, but the prophet leads the people in heartfelt worship. The prophet stirs our affections and worship in all abandoned adoration of the Savior of my soul, the Mighty One, the Lord of heaven and earth, came to save me. The key to understanding the joy of Christmas is when the incarnate creator of heaven and earth becomes the savior of your soul and the unparalleled prized possession of your heart. Notice in verse 2, it says, For the Lord God is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. So let's look at our first question. Do you understand this joy? Well, has he become your salvation. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I've heard all this before. I know all this. I even believe it. But this is what we say and do at Christmas. This is what we simply have always done. I'm not sure I can really say he has become my salvation. Or maybe today, this Christmas, he doesn't really feel like he's become your salvation. Well, if that's you, look at verse 3. Because it's the key to God becoming your salvation. It says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This language might sound familiar to you if you think about Jesus' ministry that we read of in the Gospels. In, in John 4 specifically, Jesus refers to this verse in Isaiah when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus says to her, give me a drink. And her d default reaction is to retreat into the human condition of the day, which was hatred and racism and division. And she says, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Why would you ask for a drink of water from me? And Jesus responds like this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink. And he would have given you living water. And Jesus goes on to say, and everyone who drinks of this water will never thirst again. 
Jesus says that he is the water in Isaiah's song. And this isn't the only time he does so. But then Jesus does something unexpected and impossible were he anyone other than God incarnate. He tells the woman, go call your husband and come here. And what happens next? Jesus gets right in her business. He delves uncomfortably into the very depths of her personal sin and guilt and shame. This conversation that started off talking about water has like in 30 seconds moved to her most personal and carnal sin. When we read in Isaiah 12, 3, that we will draw water from the wells of salvation, we should not think that that is always going to be easy. That we are going to get to maintain our personal comfort. Or that we should have any illusion of privacy from the Savior. We must become vulnerable. God didn't just enter into the big picture story of human history to be the great savior of a nation. Jesus himself said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus does not treat symptoms. He did not come to just treat the symptoms of our anxiety or our depression or our addiction or our sin. He enters very personally into each of our lives to save us from the great war that is within us. The war that dooms our souls, our own flesh. Jesus comes to save us from the human condition of sin itself. And in doing so, he becomes the savior of all nations. So let's get real. One reason God hasn't become your salvation is that you've guarded your heart against him. You've looked at what it takes to draw from the wells of salvation and you say, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to open up to God like that. And you've guarded your heart. Well, guess what? You're in good company. That is the most common and normal reaction to sin is to hide from him. But when we guard our hearts against Jesus, it reveals two things. First, that we really do not understand the way God's salvation works. Or secondly, we've forgotten. God's salvation begins in us when we finally stop our fight and accept that we are wrong, that I am the one who has sinned. Go back and look at verse 1 in Isaiah. It says, For though you were angry with me, God's salvation begins when we accept that God was angry at our sin and he was right to be. And this goes against everything that is within us and it go, it's antithetical to the culture in which we live. So drawing water from the wells of salvation will not always be easy and it will require letting down our guard. And we're going to have to deal with the difficult parts of our lives. But Isaiah 12, 3 says we still do it with joy. Why? How? How can this be joyful? We do it with joy when we remember that God's salvation comes through the cross. God's salvation begins at the cross, it is, it is the, where the story was always going. It is where it was always leading. The centrality of the cross. Through the cross, we can draw water from the wells of salvation with joy because we don't do it alone. Remember that the song begins and ends in the singular form of you. But here in verse 3, it's the plural. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We don't do it alone. God gives us the church accountability partners. James says, confess your sins one to the other and be healed. There is a healing peace when we will draw water from the wells of salvation together. And he gives us his Holy Spirit, a wonderful counselor, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We also can draw water from the wells of salvation with joy because we inevitably rediscover the cross along the way. In John Bunyan's Christian classic, Pilgrim's Progress, the main character uh, is, is 
absolutely burdened by this great weight. It dominates the whole theme of the first part of the book. This, this, this burden that is on his back, he is motivated to get rid of it. And then it's remarkable as the reader because like in a sentence, it's gone. Bunyan writes, as soon as I came in sight of the cross, the burden falls from my back never to return. And Christian leaps for joy and sings, thus far did I come loaded with my sin. Nor could anything ease the grief that I was in till I came here. What a place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss? Must here the burden fall off from my back? Must here the strings that bound it to me crack? Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher, blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. The joy of Christmas is in the cross. Finally, we can draw water from the wells of salvation with joy because we have a new song in our hearts every time we do it. Song is the natural response of a free spirit, a soul that has been set free. I told you Isaiah 12 is a song, and throughout my, throughout my message I've been referencing lyrics from some of my favorite worship songs that so formed my theology growing up. One of them says this, There is one heart that Jesus can't save, a heart that won't let him in. But if you will let him, Jesus will save you again and again. Are you caught in a struggle, a cycle of sin that seems impossible to overcome? Let down your guard. Jesus will save you again and again. Is there brokenness in your relationships, in your home? Let down your guard. Jesus will save you again and again. Are you experiencing the, the sustaining comfort in the face of grief and loss? The cross is power over the grave again and again. God becoming our salvation happens when the joy of Jesus' birth moves from being merely a fact to the very real and very personal joy of my sin being forgiven. I remember when this happened to me. I remember the song that I sang. Listen to the lyrics. See the God of glory giving up his son. See the awesome depths of love in all he has done. See the tiny baby on the hay so still. See him take the cross and climb up Calvary's lonely hill. Hear the roaring thunder. Feel the falling rain. See the king of glory bear unbearable pain. Dying brokenhearted, himself he would not save. See the king who died for me, now risen from the grave, my grave. It was my sin that nailed him there. It was my cross he had to bear. It was his blood that washed me clean. No greater love has this world ever seen. He died for me. He washed me clean. I am redeemed. Do you understand the joy of Christmas? The creator God becomes part of the creation, steps into our world and into our lives to give us living water to die on the cross for you and for me, to reconcile us to himself through forgiveness, to save us through the cross. So how do we respond to this joy? Well, Isaiah tells us how to respond in the rest of his song. Look in the last few verses. He says that we should respond first, obviously, in worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So we sing and we worship in response to this joy. But notice the prophet says one other way that we respond. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Let this be made known in all the earth. So we first respond in worship, but then we second respond with evangelism. To tell others of this wonderful Savior of our souls. We are hearing from every corner of Christendom that the church in the West has lost the heart of evangelism. 
The church in my generation is in desperate need for a reclamation of evangelism and we cannot rely on the way that we've done it in the past or for the church to develop and program how we share Jesus or to think,